See Jumbo. See Jumbo. See Jumbo, everyone. Good afternoon. I am your television show host, Dr. Richard Allinger of the Newburgh Theological Seminary, Department of Theology and Religious Education. See Jumbo. I'm speaking to you with a greeting in Swahili, and we are determined as followers of Christ to make a difference by submission to Christ and praying for the Heavenly Father's will. Jesus led the way to Calvary, and all we have to do is follow. And one of the seven principles in the uh, Unguna Saba in Swahili is uh, Kuji Tagalia, which means self-determination. And that is, Jesus spoke about that. If you're going to follow me, he said, you're going to have to tell yourself, pick up a cross and follow me. Be determined. Kuji Tagalia, Lia, to Kuji Tagalia in Swahili. Be determined in, within yourself, in your heart, mind, and soul to make a difference for Christ's sake. Uh, I also teach Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Arabic and Latin and have for over 10 years here in the local uh, vicinity or region of Genesee County because there's 35,000 college students uh, in just in Flint, Michigan. And uh, there's some that are interested in learning uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, Greek, and uh, Arabic and Latin. And uh, 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 in the last program, I didn't really take time to begin to uh, address the uh, concerned pastors for prayer and revival association. I promised to read the rest of the names to you uh, of the 300 most impactful evangelists over the last 200 years since the time of the radio and the uh, microphone had been invented, uh, starting in the late 1800s, around the time of the uh, Azusa Street Revival. And uh, other evangelists here were, especially here locally in our community, was uh, evangelist or shepherd, shepherdess and evangelist Catherine Hunter Williams has been very uh, uh, impactful uh, for the sake of Christ in our community. And also Eric Mays, uh, the commissioner, first ward in the city government, his, his father was, um, his dad was pastor of Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. And Eric was brought up by his parents in that church and is a man of faith. And it was just, uh, I think uh, within a month or two ago, I was uh, watching the Flint City Commission meeting has uh, the chaplain uh, and uh, uh, Reverend Freeland Threkel actually uh, has the chaplain for the commission called uh, the commission the, with the nine commissioners and the mayor to prayer. Uh, and then after he prayed for the Lord's presence and blessings and protection on the city and uh, provision, uh, uh, the first ward commissioner, Eric uh, Mays, referred to Romans chapter 828 and said to trust in the Lord. And this is what the honorable late Mayor Woodrow Stanley had said before he went home to be with Jesus, is we have come this far by faith. Remember, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you've got to have faith, yes. Uh, and only believe, because when Jesus was here in the inc miraculous incarnation, walking the earth among men before he ascended to heaven after his crucifixion and resurrection from the dead, he said that uh, the Sanhedrin in Israel, in Jerusalem, like today, Jerusalem has the population of about a million people. 
and there's about 400,000 people in Tel Aviv where, where the international airport's at. There's no international airport in Jerusalem. So you could, if you wanted to, land in Amman, Jordan and take a rent a car, a, a bus, or a taxi into Jerusalem. But uh, there's a million people in Jerusalem, and uh, they're always on Shabbos praying at the western wall, uh, sitting in lawn chairs for uh, the Lord of heaven to send Elijah uh, to them to bring great joy and help uh, uh, get the uh, third Jewish temple uh, uh, reconstructed. Uh, many uh, eschatologists in the field of theology call the third Jewish temple the tribulation temple. Uh, also, it'll be here when the 70th week of Daniel uh, f finds its fulfillment at the end of the age of the Gentiles. And I can talk with you more about that in the future. Uh, in the, f from the eyes of the, uh, the Ancient of Days in his eternal throne, he looked upon the earth when he chose Abraham's uh, uh, family and himself, Abraham, uh, and the people that he attached his name to, uh, the children of Israel, uh, to manifest himself and his Ten Commandments and uh, other civil and ceremonial laws uh, and writings uh, through the pens of his prophets uh, to the rest of the world. Because from his eyes, uh, who is the one that screwed the stars in their sockets in the first place, uh, and uh, he's uh, in such sovereign control, you know, and me being... Uh, uh, a, a grandson of John Calvin, uh, his dad is my grandpa, and uh, 500 years ago, John Calvin coined the word sovereignty, uh, repeating what St. Augustine in the 4th century did about the sovereignty of God, that he's ultimately and absolutely in control, and you can trust in his inerrant and infallible uh, logos or word and uh, with that being said that's why the verse that Eric Mays cited after the city commission was called to, uh, to order through prayer to uh, remember Romans 8.28 that all things uh, work together for the good that are called according to uh, his most uh, most ties uh, uh, redemptive plan and purposes that uh, he is in the earth by his Holy Spirit now working out through the regeneration and the rebirth ex spiritual experience. Jesus said you must be born again and once you're born again you're given and indwelt by the promised Holy Spirit and he regenerates you and renews your mind and gives you in your heart with his Holy Spirit living in your heart making you a new man. And that is more of a miracle than what he did when he uh, created the universe because the universe he uh, created out of nothing into something. But through the incarnation of what Christ did on the cross uh, he, in his redemptive work to save us from being hell bound to an eternal lake of fire, uh, actually, if we will accept his work on the cross, will save us and rescue us from being hell-bent and born with a fallen nature to be renewed in, uh, in Christ's image and also have the gift of eternal life as we yield to the Holy Spirit and become uh, holy, sanctified, holy, uh, body, mind, and spirit, and love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, you know, in the city commission also, uh, there uh, were other godly uh, 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 ministers for us that worked together to help our city, uh, especially coming through the water crisis. And uh, we're really thankful for Mayor Neely and the late, uh, the last mayor we had before Mayor Neely the Honorable Dr. Karen Weaver was uh, phenomenal in how she responded to the uh, 
water crisis here we had in Flint ever since 2013. And by the end of this year, all the new copper water pipes will be completed and installed in front of all the different residences that needed new water pipes. It's taken uh, many years to complete this project, but uh, and uh, we thank God for our leadership of Mayor Neely uh, and also uh, the former mayor, Dr. Karen Weaver. Now let us pray before I go back into church history. We believe in uh, Father uh, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in, his, and in his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered willingly under Pontius Pilate, uh, and was crucified uh, and descended into hell, and on the third day rose again from the dead. Uh, from thence he shall come to reward the redeemed and to judge the spiritually dead and to dispense gifts to men. Uh, I believe in the Holy Communion of the Saints, uh, life eternal, and the resurrection of the dead. In Jesus' name we remember this, the Apostles' Creed. And thank you for it, even though scriptures will take uh, uh, precedence over this creed that men drew up. But the Apostles' Creed, through the years of the church, while Christ has been building his church for over 2,000 years, has helped keep uh, followers on track. Accept him today if you do not know him, and uh, be saved, and then... His Holy Spirit will be faithful to indwell you as you yield to His Spirit, read your Bible and pray, and conform you into His holy image. Uh, he gave His life for us. His faithfulness to us demands our faithfulness to Him. Jesus Christ led the way to Golgotha. Jesus Christ led the way to Calvary. And all we have to do is follow. Yes, there is something we have to do. And our salvation is a miracle. And we thank the Heavenly Father for His uh, grace and mercy. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His mercy and grace endureth forever. And our prayer is also for the souls of the city of Flint that do not know Christ. That, uh, that we would invoke Christ's uh, uh, intercession on their behalf and save them and their souls from the fires of hell and the eternal lake of fire. And we ask these things in the name of your holy son, Yeshua. Uh, now, um, there were some other evangelists that impacted the uh, 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 world's people over the last 200 years that I failed to uh, cite in previous programs. And uh, there were two married couples that work as an evangelistic team. One uh, 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 Joshua Michelek and his wife Hannah and his son David. Uh, uh, David was born in Beijing, China, while his parents were doing missionary work and evangelistic work over in China, uh, uh, close to Beijing. And also another very impactful uh, evangelist married team is uh, Paul and Janessa Wright and their son Emery. And uh, they're uh, on the uh, west side of China doing evangelistic work. Uh, and missionary work uh, on the side where the bo it borders India. And then uh, um, Josh and Hannah Michelak and their son David are closer to uh, the side of China where Japan is in the South China Sea. Uh, and uh, in addition to those two, evangelistic uh, married couple teams that are doing impactful work in China. Um, uh, there also is uh, the uh, 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 impactful work that an evangelist pastor uh, um, uh, 
uh, named uh, Joel and uh, his wife Megan, uh, and uh, their children have been deployed. And uh, also there is uh, Joel Albright and his, his brother uh, Jonathan Albright and Jonathan's wife Sarah and their children uh, are doing impactful works in Salt Lake City, uh, evangelistic work, uh, even on secular college campuses and in uh, St. Francis, Minnesota. So we thank God for them uh, and the impactful work they're doing. Also, there is a uh, pastor and uh, evangelist team, uh, Rod Pfeiffer and his wife Joanne, and uh, with their son uh, Michael and uh, 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 Samantha, and their son and daughter are very uh, impactful through the years, and they've been working in youth ministry, uh, vacation Bible school outreaches they've been involved in, uh, uh, helping other children, pointing them to Jesus, and uh, also um, uh, the uh, uh, Awana programs in some of the Baptist churches that happen on Wednesday night while the adults are having a Bible study and prayer. Uh, a lot of times, uh, Michael and uh, Joanne and uh, uh, Pastor uh, uh, Rob. Uh, Pfeiffer have really been phenomenal too in, in especially pointing out uh, the need for Christ in the lives of young people. And uh, there were some others on that list. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I have a copy of it now, but I don't have it with me. And any that I recall, I would be doing from memory uh, And uh, right, uh, I, 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 I will probably have to pick up on some of the other ones that were uh, on that list that were held before the association's election committee to choose who they seem to be the most e impactful e evangelistic uh, workers uh, in the last 200 uh, years. I, I, I just I remember one. Uh, 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 his name was Evangelist L. R. Shelton. L. R. Shelton. And he's very impactful. Also, uh, uh, a radio evangelist by the name of Peter Nordior. Peter Nordior. And he was very impactful. Uh, and a lot of people uh, would seek his teachings out too uh, because of his profound insights into what discipleship and fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ actually is. Um, uh, Paul, uh, I have uh, Paul Herring who is going to help introduce. Uh, uh, some of the research I've done on Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, help us begin to understand exactly uh, what that work was about. Uh, if you go back to uh, around the 1517, around the time of Dr. Martin Luther and the 95 Thesis, uh, uh, there was a man named uh, uh, Fox and he had the last name of Fox, and it was called uh, John Fox's Book of Martyrs. And it was a uh, very voluminous eight volumes uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, documented accounts of all those who martyred and the events around their deaths for Christ's sake, from Christ and the Apostles up through the uh, Protestant Reformation in the 16th century and uh, we're going to share that with you uh, and but Fox died, John Fox died before the his voluminous eight volumes uh, actually w were uh, 
published. So after his death, a man named uh, John Day, John Day, actually put it all together in, in a form to actually be published. And that is what uh, Paul is going to share, uh, help us share with you uh, exactly uh, who, who, what, who is this uh, John Fox and the Book of Martyrs that he wrote and what, which John Day published and what, uh, who were these people, what were their names and what kind of uh, circumstances were they in, involved in this uh, 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 martyrdom. And the Bible says there's about five or six crowns to be earned because of your faithfulness faithfulness if you follow Christ and one of the crowns is a martyr's crown if you die for Christ's sake uh, in this life you will receive a martyr's crown and then there's a soul winner's crown and a crown of faithfulness and a crown of righteousness and a crown of glory and there's a, a, some more different crowns that I'll speak with you later about but with the rest of the airtime I'd like Paul Paul uh, find that book called Always Reforming by Dr. Andrew McGowan, and inside there would be a, a, a manala envelope of which there are some white typewritten pages, double-spaced, easy to read, of uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs that was submitted to seminary uh, for part of my Ph.D. program. I'll be graduating next year with a Ph.D. in church history, and this is some of the research I did, and Paul it will will share some of this as he reads it uh, to help me because as many of you know I was stricken blind last uh, um, uh, Hanukkah or last Kwanzaa uh, uh, around December 25th uh, and so uh, we celebrate this in the Western civilization uh, has has a papal decree uh, December 25th the birth of Christ Bethlehem's baby but uh, most of the uh, real church, because since Cain and Abel, there's been a fake church and a real church. And the, the real church believes Christ was born around October 14th, 5 BC. Uh, the Roman interpretation, the Roman Catholic interpreta interpretation puts it down in December 25th. But uh, there's always two interpretations. And a lot of times, that's why I've been speaking with you in the last programs about the need for always reform because uh, uh, if the church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church thought that they were the only ones with the Pope and the College of Cardinals to actually be the interpreters of God's Word and kept it all locked up for over a thousand years in the dark Middle Ages. But that's why the Protestant Reformation and Dr. Martin Luther happened is to bring Bibles into everybody else's language and revive the gospel that have been lost over in, a, in a, over a thousand years of spiritual darkness after Christ and the apostles died or were martyred. Now of Christ and his twelve, there was only one that did not martyr, and that was John the Elder. He died uh, at over about a hundred years old uh, in a city uh, north between uh, Jerusalem and uh, Ephesus, Turkey, uh, and it was a city uh, uh, Mary and her family, after uh, just before the 70 A.D. destruction of Jerusalem, uh, the Roman uh, legions made it a bloodbath there in 70 A.D. and destroyed the temple. But just before it was destroyed, the Lord had Mary and her family, the Lord's family, uh, brothers and sisters that were still living because uh, his brother James was a bishop of the Jerusalem church, was martyred too before his family fled before the 70 A.D. destruction of the temple to a city called Pella. And up there, a little bit north of Pella, is uh, um, Edessa, and that's where John Mark martyred, and uh, Peter. Peter did not martyr in Rome, and even Paul uh, was not beheaded at the chopping block in Rome. There was a place where he was detained uh, for this death outside the city in a suburb of Rome. Say, for instance, I'm, I live here in Flint, Michigan, and let's say that uh, uh, the uh, Gestapo of the Nazi Party took over here, and they didn't like what I was teaching and talking about Christ, similar to what happened to Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany, an underground Christian and Bible college teacher, and he was also involved in the assassination plot of Hitler. 
Uh, well, if the Gestapo came here and took me out of Flint, where I stay, to Mount Morris, and said, uh, and then they said, right now we're going to kill you. And so I was really killed in Mount Morris. I was not killed in Rome or in Flint. And the reason the Roman Catholic interpretation says Paul was petered in Rome, Paul was uh, martyred in Rome, and they even say Peter was martyred in Rome, which is not true, but it adds validity to their um, interpretation, which doesn't seem to really be biblical, uh, uh, as to uh, Peter and the Pope being him who sits in Peter's chair. And he believes he's the king of the world and can make all these decrees that uh, he is the king of the world and he decrees that Virgin Mary is the co-redemptrix and had something to do with your uh, intercession before God Almighty the Father. And she uh, is a sinner just like you and me and she needed a savior too. But the Pope, they've deified Mary in what is called Mariology and with the papal decrees. And I could go on for hours about how they've twisted the scriptures, but right now we're gonna go to the people who died for the gospel's truth. Truth matters. And Paul's gonna share with you some of the people who resisted with their faith onto blood to further the gospel. Paul, could you help me now? All right, I am looking. Um, Would you like to sit here? No, not necessary. Okay. Not necessary. I'm gonna turn this microphone on. And <laughs> with any luck, they can hear me. Yeah, I well, I remember, Paul. You had already in the in the tight pages talked about uh, India's Mahatma Gandhi before his some of his teachings. Uh, before he was assassinated, uh, the last time you were reading that paper, mm -hmm. and you just begin to introduce us to what is typed there in some of my research about Fox's Book of Martyrs. Okay, well, I'm going to start at the top of the page where it was left, so I'm assuming okay. this is where we left off. Yes. And I'm going to go to the new paragraph, and of course these glasses aren't the best. But, let me see if i got a better pair. Ah. There we go. That's better. All right. In the edited edition of this written history of the lives, sufferings, and deaths of the early Christians and Protestant martyrs, William Bryan Forbush presented the original eight-volume set of Fox's Book of Martyrs into the following chapters and divisions. History of Christian Martyrs to the First General Prosecution under Nero. The Glorious Company of Apostles. Two, the Ten Primitive Persecutions. One, Nero Burns, Christians in the Imperial Gardens. Two, Ignatius, the Wheat of Christ. Three, Polycarp refuses to deny Christ. Four, the Beheading of Justin Martyr. 5. Christians in the Catacombs 6. Origins Suffered by Fire 7. St. Lawrence's Bed of Iron and 8. Sebastian is Pierced with Arrows 3. The Persecution of the Christians in Persia 1. The Emperor Constantine Protests 2. The Fury of Julian the Apostate 3. The Goths and the Vandals. 4. The Last Roman Triumph. 5. Noble Gothic Prince. 6. The Sacrificing of Boniface. 7. Bishop Alphigs Defends Canterbury. Then 4. Papal Prosecutions. Prosecution of the Brave Waldenus. Waldenses. Waldenses. Two, the Pope warns against the uh, Abogis. Uh, Albigenses. Albigenses, okay. Albigenses. Albigenses. Yeah. Three, the massacre of St. Bartholomew. Four, suffering after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Five, martyrdom of John Callus. Listen, uh, we're at the halfway mark now. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. You got the book upside down, Richard. Oh, well, let me tell me when it's right. There it is. I'll uh -uh, keep going, keep going. There we go. All right, I want to make sure. Can you make sure that they see what it is? Sure. This is the Fox's Book of Martyrs here, okay. and that's what, Paul, you've been sharing. Thank you for straightening. I can't see. 
Thank you. Are we going to take a breather? We are going to take a breather. We're okay. going to take a, a break and we'll be right. Go ahead and tell them. We'll be right back after this. We'll be right back after this. I'm so glad that you could rejoin us to learn uh, of some of the faithful followers of Christ who resisted with their faith unto blood and surrendered their lives unto death uh, for the Lord's sake. Uh, I remember one of the first martyrs was the Hel uh, Hel Hellenistic Jew follower, uh, uh, St Stephen or Stephen in Greek. Uh, he was stoned in Jerusalem after Christ was crucified and rejected by the Sanhedrin there and was telling the people around there with his uh, persuasion and convincing words that they crucified the Prince of Glory and that this be not laid to their charge. But some of them even said, as he was bleeding on the cross, let his blood be upon us and our children. Oh, they've had a lot of repercussions because of that, especially in the last century with that awful Jewish holocaust underneath the Third Reich, Hitler and his henchmen called the Gestapo. Well, uh, not to get into that, I, I was just telling our director, uh, program director Paul Herring, that I thank God for this purified bottled water and that the C.S. Mott, uh, C.S. Mott Foundation had made a generous $45 million donation to the city of Flint to make sure those water pods were being stocked with this water for people. They would give you anywhere from 8 to 20 cases if you would drive by the pod at different locations in churches and different places in businesses to keep us in good clean water before uh, Dr. Karen Weaver and Mayor Neely could get all of the new copper pipes installed the shiny new copper pipes. It's wonderful to be able now, after this almost seven year crisis has been resolved, to be able to take showers uh, again and to be able to brush our teeth with water out of the sink and water our plants and feed our uh, animals water without having to think that they're going to die or be killed too. Uh, I just thank God for the congressional investigation that our program director, Paul Herring, covered when it went on uh, back in 2015 down in Washington, D.C., and uh, many of the Environmental Protection Agency uh, people, uh, employees, had to uh, be put in prison for their negligence here. Well, thank God that it's been addressed and resolved now. Thank God for the leadership at the city, the local level, the state, and also uh, the national level. You know, uh, FEMA was involved too, the Federal Emergency uh, F, uh, Federal F, FEMA, F E M A, Federal Emergency Management Agency too. So we thank God for all the levels of government and their help to get this water crisis resolved. And just think, uh, it's so hot in hell that that rich man that died wanted just a drop of water to put on his tongue. He was in so much heat in the fires of hell, just wanted one drop of water. I just thank God that uh, this water has been made available to us through, by and large, mostly the great generosity of the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. And I thank God for C.S. Mott and his family 
and the foundation work and the great work they've done in getting uh, educational institutions uh, uh, established here in Flint, especially the C.S. Mott College, and which was the former Flint Community Junior College, and the University of Mich uh, Michigan Extension here in Flint, Michigan, and the one that's in Dearborn also. And as you know, I've spoke to you before about uh, Pastor Kim Yarber of Mount Hermon Missionary Baptist Church uh, is an adjunct professor in both the Flint and uh, um, Dearborn, Michigan, University of Michigan teaching black history adjunct. So thank God for him. And he does a very impactful evangelistic work here locally uh, and in Genesee County. And uh, uh, the youth especially uh, are uh, uh, enamored by uh, his creative abilities and his evangelizing uh, lost souls on purpose for the glory of God and his master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, getting back to those who resisted by their faith the Lord Jesus Christ and would not renounce their faith, uh, were tortured in many ways and burnt to death at stakes. They were dismembered, their fingers, toes were cut off. And like even in the Old Testament, this is not new. Uh, Isaiah the prophet, 600 years before Christ, was actually put in a log and sawed in half. And this is what happens to people that really love God and are impactful, that really love the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Uh, they have to suffer persecution many times unto death. Have you yet resisted unto death? Uh, have you yet resisted unto blood with your faith? Uh, and now I'm going to uh, uh, give the program over to Paul so he can share with you some of these uh, honorable people followers of Christ uh, in times past that have now received a glorious crown, martyr's crown uh, in the heavenly city where the holy persons three are enthroned. Paul? All right, I'm going to, um, I think I left off with papal prosecutions. Yes. So that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go to papal prosecutions. And one is persecution of the brave Waldenists. Wait, we did that. Martyrdom of John Callis. We read that. Thank you. All right, so five, an account of the Inquisition. One is the fierce zeal of the demonic. Two is the hounds of the Lord. Three is a typical inquisitor. Four is a cruel handling of Nicholas Burton. Five, some private enormities of the Inquisition. Six is the persecution of Dr. Ridido. Yeah. Ridido. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. The tormenting of Dr. Gardner. Gardner. Yes. And the suffering of William Lithgow. And then the final one is the story of Galileo. I'm sorry. The the last one is the summary of the Inquisition. Oh, okay. You want me to continue? Well, just because you paused there. Uh, Galileo, uh, with his telescope, found out that the uh, sun doesn't revolve around the earth, and the Pope put him on the list to be killed, too, because the Pope thought he was the center of the universe and that the earth didn't revolve around the sun like Galileo found out. So he had to go into hiding, too, and be quiet. Uh, remember this. If these people that Paul's going to share with you played the role of see no evil, speak no evil, hush, hush, and hear no evil, they would not have been martyred. And the Catholic, Roman Catholic Inquisition under the leadership of Ignatius of Loyola, the Jesuit, starting the Jesuits to counteract the Reformation and what the Reformation was doing in spreading the good news and getting the gospel to other people instead of just being locked up to the pulpit in the Vatican uh, they would not have had to suffer these deaths. Again, Paul, I thank you for helping me. All right, so now it says, it was here in the above section 5 of the account of the Inquisition of the Roman Catholic Church, beginning in the 12th century, John Fox writes, When the Reformed religion began to diffuse the gospel light throughout Europe, Pope Innocent III entertained great fear for the Romanist Church. He accordingly 
instituted a number of inquisitors or persons who were to make inquiry after, apprehend and punish heretics as the reforms were called by the papists. At the head of these inquisitors was one demonic who had been canonized by the pope in order to render his authority and more and more respectable the dominic and other inquisitors spread themselves into various roman catholic countries and treated the protestants with the utmost severity in the process of time the pope not finding these roving inquisitors so useful as he had imagined resolved upon the establishment of fixed and regular courts the first office of the inquisition was established in the city of toulouse and demonic and demonic became the first roving inquisitor yeah dominic dominic okay. yeah courts of inquisition were now erected in several countries but the spanish inquisition became the most powerful and the most dreaded of any even the kings of Spain themselves, through, though arbitrary in all respects, were taught to dread the power of the lords of the Inquisition and the horrid, horrid cruelties they exercised compelled multitudes who differed in opinion from the Roman Catholic carefully to conceal their sentiments. The most zealous of all the Papist monks and those who most implicitly obeyed the Church of Rome were the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Therefore, the Pope thought proper to invest with an exclusive right of presiding over the different courts of Inquisition and gave them the most unlimited powers as judges delegated by him and immediately representing his person. They were permitted to excommunicate or sentence to death whom they thought proper upon the most slight information of heresy. They were all allowed to publish crusades against all whom they deemed heretic and to enter into leagues with sovereign princes to join their crusades with their forces. All of the officers and those of the network of the Inquis Inquisition were sworn to secrecy. The Inquisition likewise takes cognizance of such who read the Bible in the common language. The Talmud of the Jews. The Talmud of the Jews. That was a. Boom, 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 boom. I lost it. Okay, you, hold on. There, I think you saw The Talmud of the Jews. Or the Quran of the Methomedians? Yeah. Mahomedians. Yeah. The maxim of the Inquisition being to strike terror and awe those who were subject of its power into obedience. High birth, distinguished rank, great dignity, or eminent employment are no protection from these severities. And the lowest officer of the Inquisition can make the highest characters tremble. When a person impeached is condemned, he is either severely whipped, violently tortured, sent to fed with many an agony. South America was partitioned into provinces of the Inquisition, and with a ghastly memory of the crimes of the mother state, the arrival of viceroys and other popular celebrations were thought imperfect within the Aldefi. The Netherlands were one scene of slaughter from the time of the decree when planted the, in when the, when planted the Inquisition among them. In Spain, the calculation is more attainable. Each of the 17 tribunals during a long period burned annually, on average, 10 miserable beings. We are to recollect that this number was in a country where persecution had for ages abolished all religious differences and where the difficulty 
and where the difficulty was not to find the stake, but the offering. Yet even in Spain, thus gleaned of all heresy, the Inquisition could still swell its list of murders to 32,000. The numbers burned in effigy or condemned to penance, punishment generally equivalent to exile, compensation, and taint of blood. To all ruin but the mere loss of worthless life amounted to 309,000. But the crowds who perished in dungeons of torture, of confinement, and of broken hearts, the millions of dependent lives made utterly helpless or hurried to the grave by the death of the victims are beyond all resetters or recreated, recreated only before him, who has sworn that he that leaveth in captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. All right, we're about ten minutes out. You want to keep going or you want well, to take uh, it over? I wanted to speak a little before I ask you to pick up a little bit. Okay. And uh, I wanted to bring up the question because the first martyrs were in Jerusalem, Christ and his apostles, apostles and in that region of uh, Turkey, Ephesus, and uh, the seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 2 in, in uh, Asia Minor. And really Rome was just kind of like uh, uh, a place where some bishops started a church and uh, 500 years into the church age after Christ the Apostles were no longer here. Uh, Christ in his body and uh, the martyrdom of all the apostles except John the Elder who died natural causes in uh, Odessa. Uh, uh, that, uh, 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 because every city in Asia Minor, uh, uh, Antioch, Syria, they were first called Christians, uh, um, Cairo, Egypt, and down in uh, Ethiopia, uh, they were first uh, the Donatist Christians there. They didn't see eye to eye. The Donatist followers of Christ in Northern Africa with the uh, bishops who were, this is before there was a pope in the first 500 years, they didn't see eye to eye with what some of the bishops in Rome were beginning to uh, interpret their idea of what or opinion of who Christ was and what he and how he would build his church. They differed with the, the North Africans too, but they were both uh, followers uh, of Christ and believed that he did die as the Son of God to save people from their sins. Uh, and uh, then the cities of Ephesus and the other cities were in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You can read for yourself. But all these cities had bishops in them, and there was really no... A city that had preeminence over another city until later on after the uh, when the year 500 got here and the bishops in Rome wanted to be preeminent in their interpretations of everything uh, uh, and uh, begin to bring a, a pope in called Gregory the Great and so on uh, be, it become what we know today as the organized Roman Catholic Church uh, but really I would have to say with, with that being said uh, leave you with this question. Uh, what does Rome have to do with Jerusalem? Again, let me ask you that question. What does Rome have to do with Jerusalem? And uh, I have to also say, uh, because uh, uh, now that Jerusalem is the um, capital of Israel, uh, and uh, the, during the Trump administration, he had went over there while he was president, the sitting president, and prayed at the Western Wall where the other Jews are praying for Elijah to come and bring them and their nations of people joy and help them orchestrate the reconstruction of what we call the Third or tri Tribulation Temple. But uh, President Trump was the first president of the United States out of uh, 40 five of them, I believe uh, 
President Biden is a 46th president and President Trump was a 45th and President Barack Hussein Obama was the 44th president. But uh, of them all, President Trump, it is said by the Heritage Foundation in Jerusalem, the caretakers of the Western Wall of what remains of the Jewish temple that was destroyed in 70 AD, is the only president of the United States out of all 46 of them that actually came and prayed at the wall when he had as sitting president. Now the other presidents from George Washington up to uh, President Biden may have went over there, but they weren't sitting presidents when they did. I thought you might like to know that uh, little tidbit of uh, something that the uh, founder of the Heritage Foundation sent to me in a letter here recently in a communication uh, after the uh, Corona COVID outbreak quarantine because it even affected them and how they would let people uh, under the uses of, of masks to reduce the risk of catching uh, COVID uh, actually had to regulate and control people. There's a million people in Jerusalem and well over half of them go and pray daily at the wall. Uh, they say that uh, Jerusalem prays but Tel Aviv plays. P-L-A-Y-S. Jerusalem prays. P-R-A-Y-S. But Tel Aviv plays because Tel Aviv city is on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and they have white sandy beaches and a lot of people uh, like to uh, uh, swim and suntan there so uh, that there's there it is and the international airport is in Tel Aviv there's no international airport in Jerusalem and uh, so with that being said uh, I wanted uh, also to leave you with that question uh, what does Rome have to do with Jerusalem? Uh, now, uh, Paul, would there be any time left for you to share any more insights from John Fox's uh, Book of Martyrs with us in this program or not? I don't think so. We only got about four minutes. I think you can carry it. Oh, okay. Well, you can. Uh, we will get back with you, and the this program here will be aired. And it will be called the August 2020 uh, program. Uh, and in the next September session, 2020, we will share with you some more of these truths of those who resisted unto blood and laid their lives down for the furtherment of the gospel. Uh, and in the few minutes that we have left, I wanted to remind you, the community here locally, that the uh, 16th annual prayer chain day uh, rally is scheduled to uh, be on noon at the city hall in the back parking lot you can see the police station from there and I believe because of the corona uh, risk of the Omicron and Delta variant they're going to just to be safe ask the people to continue to remain in your cars and do not rally on the front lawn of the city hall like they have in the past before the corona outbreak and they will be driving through, uh, through the city in a prayer parade all staying in their cars there will be a speaker as they get back from the parade and remain in their cars a loudspeaker and usually uh, the former sheriff of Genesee County uh, 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 Sheriff Piquel is going to usually speak and be vice president, one of the vice presidents of the uh, TCT, uh, Christian Television Network in Marion, uh, Illinois. Uh, Bishop Lonnie Brown will be there to usually bring some words. And uh, Geneva Spheres, who worked with the former uh, Janet Piquel, she's deceased now, uh, in the Prayer Chain Day initiative will usually speak to us over the phone on a loudspeaker because she is being treated with uh, dialysis treatments now and she does like me have some uh, problems with her uh, visual abilities and uh, good eyesight I did see her husband Lewis and her at the uh, Mid Michigan Eye Clinic the other day and she has asked us to continue to pray and remember her mother she's a hundred and two years old that lives with her down there on McClellan Street and DuPont Street across the street from St. Mark's Missionary Baptist Church. We hope to see all of you uh, in a uh, 
Uh, Paul, what's that word in Swahili for um, like uh, faith? Imani. Imani. Because there's about 150 churches in the faith groups or Imani in Swahili that have been participating in this event once a year around the Jewish holiday of uh, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. It'll be in September 24th, the last Saturday in September, and Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which will be in the Hebrew calendar, 5,783. And their New Year, the Jewish New Year, will be there too. That's usually when we have this annual event. So continue to be in prayer, uh, especially for now the uh, director, uh, Pastor uh, Scott Beck, because he's kind of holding the fort down for Ge uh, Geneva too. Geneva prays without ceasing for the Holy Spirit's uh, uh, influence in the city to help move souls toward looking to the Lord Jesus for their hope, because he truly is our only hope as a people, as a family of people, as a church, and has a nation and has a world. Jesus is the light of the world. And with that being said, I'm going to say, this is your friend, Dr. Richard Allinger, saying, I was made in Flint and proud of it. See you at the Prayer Chain Day Rally, September 24th at noon at the City Hall.